Community Conversations, a series of Q&A with endo experts and advocates hosted by the Endometriosis Foundation of America and My Endometriosis Team. I'm Tatanisha Williams with My Endometriosis Team, the social network for over 120,000 people living with endometriosis. And I'm also one of those 120,000 um, members that belong to My Endometriosis Team. Um, welcome everyone. Today, we'll be focusing on deep debilitating and pain and endometriosis. I am so thrilled to be joined by Dr. Tamir Sechkin, the co-founder and president of the Endometriosis Foundation of America. He's going to walk us through this important topic. Dr. Sechkin, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, nice having me here. Thank you. Yes, I'm so glad to be chatting with you. Um, it's a pleasure. Uh, Dr. Sechkin, I'd love to begin this conversation by hearing about yourself and your career. Can you share that with our community? Oh my, sure. It's my pleasure. I am, I am a gynecological surgeon. That means, you know, I operate on fem female uh, conditions that deserve surgery. My background, I'm a trained uh, gynecologist. I finished University of Buffalo program and finished that 1985, came to New York City. And since then I've been in New York City, um, both in Brooklyn then, then Manhattan for the last almost 30 years, um, out of Lenox Hill Hospital. Uh, and try to, you know, basically I focused on endometriosis in 19, starting 1990. Um, and one of the reasons where at that time, the most uh, common prevalent matter of discussion, always pelvic pain was that, but we always believed until that time, most of the pelvic pain was, uh, was basically due to, uh, it was the belief of some sort of occult infections. And whether that is chlamydia at that time or gonorrhea, sexually transmitted disease was the center of uh, all writings and discussions. And, and uh, there was no internet then, uh, whatever around. So everyone who came with pelvic pain, they, we, we, all gynecologists made sure that they do their, their GC, chlamydia and gonorrhea culture. And when they were asked, the woman would say, hey, come on, I, I haven't been with someone or I haven't with, with one partner. Well, you know, it, it, the conversation always came to a point of winking, you know, you don't know these things, we have to check it. And the lady would return home. Uh, I guess you, you can imagine what would be in their mind. I mean, is my partner with someone or... or right. They, and she would have felt like she would be somewhat uh, presumptively hold responsible with sleeping with others about not telling. Mm -hmm. So, or emergency room, and they would do the old uh, sexually uh, transmitted disease kit. Everything mm -hmm. is being done and the questions were asked, asked very bluntly. So, when I was very curious when I start looking into these uh, ladies inside, once their pain was consistent and their cultures were negative, I was, I started seeing all these lesions. In training, we never, I never, I, I had maybe one or two endometriosis cases I've seen in my six years of training, believe it or not. Um, so you didn't see these patients in the hospital, in, in the training programs either. And there was no, in the, in our academical or textbook of gynecology where they taught us how you should be treating women, there was a chapter on endometriosis, but it was maybe five pages out of 500, 600 pages where sexually transmitted disease and other conditions were more prevalent and you know, on and on. Mm -hmm. uh, the bottom line is I, I saw this, this as an issue at that time and I started reading about it. And I saw some people have been way before me looking at the same things they have named it and in, interestingly, I, I, my, I was basically gravitated towards this, sucked into it. Mm -hmm. Whether there was a call or not, I don't know, but I, I found myself in this very, very little less traveled path uh, of dealing with this without really knowing how, how the best treatment was. For me at that time, the best 
the recognition of the lesions were were most or in in any way I, as i treated and removed these lesions i mean i saw this woman really got so so much better they were thanking me mm-hmm. i think that thanking being thanked is, is something that really uh, incredibly drives us forward yes no matter what but it is being thanked you're changing someone's uh life or the way they feel about themselves was incredible. I still remember some of the major cases I've done 30 years ago that changed my course and gave me more courage to go. So initially you would treat simple things, but then you started dealing with, you know, deeper disease, difficult cases. Yeah. And yes. at earlier, I was a vascular, I was also a trained vascular surgeon to a degree. Mm-hmm. I did general surgery residency a short time. During that time, I did exclusively vascular surgery. So, and on my background, I, I did really very long training. Um, so I was exposed to many aspects of surgical problematic cases. Mm-hmm. And one of the, I think the key points in my training, I started very early on, I met Dr. Harry Rich, who, who has been on, he's retired now. But he was the first guy who did hysterectomy, laparoscopic hysterectomy in the world. So everybody knew Dr. Rich in the world. So Mm -hmm. uh, I went to Hawaii and we became very good friends due to my interest. I think he, we we had a great long jog and we we befriended. So we became almost partners in New York City then. But I learned how to suture. Suturing was the key. So suturing in laparoscopy, putting things together meant everything. So you learn learn to treat the deep disease, remove the disease, but Mm -hmm. there is a defect that you need to close. If you don't close that and you cut the patient open and call other doctors and you can't finish the thing, that doesn't go well. And probably you don't do the thing second time, it's over for you. So I was able to... Can I ask you, can we circle back to something you said? Um, You said you still remembered um, people that you treated 30 years ago and how they thanked you um, for easing their, you know, pain and and recognizing what was happening to them. Is that what inspired you to co-found EndoFound? Well, certainly it it did. Uh, Well, uh, in in truth, the EndoFound again was founded by six or eight six six again six endometriosis patients that that believed in what i was doing and uh, mm-hmm. exactly that that's how we got it going and i i saw the massive need for this massive need for research massive need for awareness and you know as a physician i saw myself limited i want to give give the microphone or or the give the mouthpiece to people who have the disease and they start talking about it and i saw the effect of it and that was 2006 i actually i actually filed for end of on and i found it on paper but I, I i activities were limited then you know may, like many others some celebrities came i treated them I really approached them. You said, I told them, listen, you got to talk about this, you know? So it was only Padma that really got going. He, yes. She was, because yes. she was very mad. She was treated by very prominent people, mm-hmm. in major universities in New York City and, and California, Los Angeles. And she was mad. She didn't, st- when I, after I operated, I said, hey, look, she had, you had endometriosis. And she said, what? Endo what? So... Everything start with endo what? It was a common thing we used to say at that time. Endo what? Right, was right. endo what? And, She's uh, very prominent. She, I've I've heard about her story. Um, lots of us that uh, suffer from endometriosis have are grateful to Padma for sharing her. her and uh, when Padma shared her story, then Whoopi Goldberg, Susan yeah. Sarandon, yep. Lena Dunham, they all started to talk about their their story. Uh, you know, you saw others. I mean, just lately, obviously, you know, uh, Miss Schumer uh, talked about it. Right. right. Um, you know that that gives us the face because we we can't bring this as much as they can bring. They have followers. People believe in their stories uh, mm-hmm. in a different way. So many people follows them. 
um, yeah, that is, the, so disease was real. It was, I was intrigued with the uh, stigma, well, taboo stick culture, which is attached to menstruation and the shame, yes. shame attached to it in the, in the present day of our lives with stigma around it. And, you know, it's, it's something that's very, and as a doctor, you, you, you believe there's no need to have those. You, you can talk about these. Right. And this is well, the same. As a, yeah. As a patient, as someone who has lived with endometriosis, um, I thank you for that. And I thank you for um, giving us, um, the community, um, some background on um, how you came to start EndoFound and what inspired you to focus on endometriosis. So Dr. Um, Sechkin, um, as someone living with endometriosis, the topic of pain and pain management is incredibly important to me. I lived with pelvic pain as a result of endometriosis all of my teenage years and for most of my adult life. Um, I had to plan my schedule around my cycle because the pain and related symptoms were so debilitating. I spent the first day of every cycle in tears, bent over in excruciating pain and vomiting the entire day. My family doctor referred to these symptoms as normal. So Dr. Sechkin, I know there are a lot of misconceptions surrounding endometriosis, so I'd love to start here. What are some of the main theories about what causes endometriosis and why does it so often go misdiagnosed? Well, regardless of the theories, let's come to the real thing. Okay. You, you see, what is the main reason it's misdiagnosed? Yes. So the issue is you were 11 or 12, right? You were, you started having this excruciating yeah, pains. You were crying. Actually 13, 13 years old. Yes. You're 13. Your mom, you brought, your mom visualizes, saw you going through this and mm -hmm. to, to, brought you to family doctor. And family doctor right. said it was normal. Yes. What does this family doctor think? Of course, he's going to say it's more normal. She, he wouldn't say endometriosis, things like that. But the thing is, what should have been done at that moment? Probably, you know, let's follow her. You know, I, obviously, you, nobody will stamp you with endometriosis at the age of 13. It's not right. fair. But the, the right thing is endometriosis is associated with periods. Okay. So if this, your mother should be whispered to her ears, look, please follow her. If, if she doesn't get better or if, if the condition does, doesn't ease after taking certain pain medication or even at that age, you can be on birth control because when the time, right time comes. But certainly the thing is assuring you, maybe saying normal is okay, but maybe not normal. Not normal. It's not normal telling a, a lady, at a young girl at 13 is not fair either. So you have to really observe that very well. So the bottom line is uh, the role of mothers, mm -hmm. the role of mothers are crucial here. The doctors, we know doctors are doctors. You know, we'll, we'll try to change them. We'll do our best. But <laughs> awareness of mothers is the key because if one doctor doesn't address, then you go to the second doctor, third doctor, and things like that. So that is that is the key. We're going to come back to other things, what makes the thing that uh, delays um, with respect to other symptoms that can come and you divert it to other specialists. Why? What are the theories of endometriosis? So, look, uh, we got to simplify this. I mean, okay. you know, <laughs> the theories from the stars, theories from the this, that. There are a lot of flat earthers here, okay? There are a mm -hmm. lot of people who claim, uh, you know, the babies come from, from the storks. Storks bring the baby or Mother Mary was merging type of things. You know, this is, this is, this is the attitude we have. A lot of want, people want to create something that's not true. Endometriosis is, is a disease of periods, okay? Menstruation. That's it. It's associated with menstruation. The pain is the pain is pain. Pain is uterine origin or somewhere else origin. But right. for women, when you train them, when they have pain, it shouldn't be bang endometriosis. So pain may be many other things. So the theory is why these glands pop out outside the uterus, okay? That's endometriosis, right? Mm -hmm. So 
your pain with first pain with period, you nobody knows what what that pain is really. It could be uterine pain. Uterus is trying to expel the blood. Your okay. cervix is tight. None. It's the first time it's testing the uterine pressure to get the blood out, and that blood squirts out. Yes. From the tubes out. There's no doubt about it. Probably it even starts on telash before the period starts. Mm -hmm. Telash meaning that as you were, your breast buds are were developing, you're putting height, your, the hair is coming up, and the period really comes right around later in that stage. It's the final episode of maturing, you know, at that stage. So until that time, though, there is activity inside the uterus. So Within that three years, there could be some migration of the glands outside through the tubes. This is the most commonly believed theory, okay? That's Samson's theory. And I register to that because I've been doing this 35 years. And anybody who's going to argue that with me should have the same experience with me, okay? The problem is this, this argument comes from everywhere else that a lot of researchers, this and that. Researchers don't see an endo patient with the way we see it. I have mm -hmm. done over 5,000 traces and we have, I have removed more than 25,000 specimens. This is a true fact. In the last 10 years only, forget the other 20 years. This is all in Lenox Hill House. I excise tissue, I examine the tissue when it's uh, interesting. I do cases during the time of period. Every, every time I look inside, there is retrograde tons of even even three weeks after, these patients yuckily feel they're tired. There's there's almost a Coca Cola, uh, Coca Cola, uh, hundred cc that volume blood swimming inside all the gland, all the tissues. Believe it or not, wow. this, this is fact. Wow. So that's one theory. Obviously, there is other theories that. So in some women, the blood is squirted back more often than the others. Two, three cc is okay. Everybody has that. Even five cc, uh, that's fine. The body absorbs. But in some women, it's, it is the volume of half Coca-Cola bottle or full Coca-Cola bottle in some women. Yeah. Last week, I did a case. We removed three liters of blood tinge fluid from the woman. Every, every She was having ascites with, with blood tinge. I mean, this woman was suffering, believe it or not, I will... We'll show it one day when she speaks out. You know, the, the, this is what number. So th that's why we start the treatment becomes, let's stop the periods, birth control. But why do right. we give birth control? Right. It doesn't treat endometriosis, but it, it minimizes the amount of bleeding. It stops right. ovulation, right? It stops mm -hmm. ovulation. So that's, the, that's why women in the end opt to have hysterectomy. Enough is enough. They say, mm -hmm. even though hysterectomy is not treatment, it triggers because there's scarring already built. When the uterus contracts, it pulls on and constant pain. Hysterectomy mm -hmm. becomes the heart of endometriosis pathology, even though it's not the real cause of the issue. Right. Even though the lesions are around, there's scarring, uterus becomes the heart of the issue. So, so that's wrong. So embryologically, they say women may have these glands. It is true, but to be honest with you, maybe less than 1% one, 1 of the time. I haven't seen any, except back in old days, 100 years ago, they said it could be from embryological rest, this, that. You don't, I haven't seen any time right now, pathologist reads, oh, this gland is from, you know, uh, ectopic mullerian tissue that's been there right. from birth. It's not. And trust me also, the... Uh, the uh, autopsies that's done on, on, on uh, newborns, mm -hmm. you know, they say that there could be endo. It is true mm -hmm. because in newborns, when the mother's hormones ret uh, are retracted, there's break breakthrough bleeding in in some in in maybe all all female girls to a degree. We see six percent of the time we see uh, we see fetal blood within the vagina as period six days. 10 days after birth. So there is a little bit of that kind of activity that can push these cells backwards too. Overall, if you look at the sequence of endometrios, how it develops, it's adolescence to endometrioma, then deep endo, then endometriosis of the thorax. Mm -hmm. These really happened at the age of 30, the, the most advanced cases. Right. If, this right. was, if these were inborn, 
If you had them, you would be having thoracic endometriosis uh, at the age of 15. I've never seen one. You know, you know what I'm saying? These things develop slowly. So endometriosis progresses. Endometriosis on the right side. Why is it right side, not left side? Do you think mm -hmm. embryologically they're equally developed? Why is it more on the left side of the pelvis, more on the right? More, less on the right because there's colon there. It squeezes the blood, traps the blood. I have beautiful slides for these things. All my life, I've been looking at this thing. And yeah. this is that's, the top. That's top. super interesting. I, I'm, wow. And, then really? genetically, and genetically, let's say, honestly, it's uh -huh. multifactorial genetic disease. You yeah. have your blood has a tendency to stick. Stick yeah. and survive. The glands have tendency to survive. They have probably more powerful survival instinct, those glands and cells. In some women also, oh. there is little configuration of the uterus, like the arcuate uterus or little septum, mm -hmm. subtle that you don't, I see this 30% of the time, there's arcuate uterus. These cells, uterus is shaped as heart shape. So mm -hmm. there is tendency to push to the corner and the blood is pumped more yeah. towards the thing. 30%, I have beautiful slides of those. Yeah. Well, let me ask you, uh, uh, Dr. Sechkin, uh, yesterday you gave um, a keynote speech at EndoFound's Patient Day Conference on the subject of deep endometriosis. Can you um, explain to the community what is deep endometriosis and how is it unique from other forms of endometriosis? So endometriosis is a disease of pain, okay? Mm -hmm. If there was no pain, we would never know about endometriosis. In right. some patients, it's infertility is uh, equated with endometriosis. So when you have pain, there are, I look at pain and I question patients' pain in three groups. First okay. pain is your, I would be asking your level of, how would you scale your menstrual pain out of 10? Oh, 200 people say 200. <laughs> I'm on the floor. What are you talking about? Yes. So... Then I ask, how long does it? It's two days, fine. But the third day is not normal. Mm -hmm. Or the pain starting right after the period starts, it should be gradually off, it's right. down. And then even though period stops, the lady's pain goes on. So, so that is, there's two components. So menstrual pain itself is uterine origin. Mm -hmm. It's tantral, it's crampy, and with the blood coming down, it should cease, it should slow down the intensity of pain immediately. With uh, Advil, Motrin, you should be okay, mm -hmm. right? But the pain that's peritoneal due to irritation of the peritoneum, pelvic sidewall, internal organs, lining, peritoneum, it's called peritoneal endometriosis later. That kind of pain is has, has bowel, also GI symptoms heavily with right. it. Mm -hmm. uh, not that, not that, not not that uterine pain doesn't have any GI GI symptoms because it's all peritoneal being pulled. But peritoneal pain due to early endometriosis have it may be more on the right side, more on the left side. It is more more uh, sustained pain wise uh, beyond the period you feel it than ovulation pain. These women have ovulation pain; they can lateralize it most more on my right side, more on my left side. So mm -hmm. we ask these questions. So there's uterine pain, there's peritoneal pain, and there is retroperitoneal pain. So in other words, pain as the endometriosis get deep, that's, that is pain is different. That right. pain becomes more, more, they can lateral, it's more on my left side. I have it on my leg, front, back, sciatica or groin area or, mm -hmm. uh, vulvar area that's deep endo that's deep deep retroperitoneal pain then there is deep invasive endometriosis or deeply infiltrative endometriosis issues constipation mm -hmm. diarrhea you know we ask immediately how often do you go number two you know every every two weeks yeah. are you kidding with me every two weeks all right well, when i go i go little by little it's like like a pebbles or it's yeah. a pencil thin, so diagnostic. These women have bowel disease. They have strictures on their eye. Yeah. I also don't believe that some of our older attending, senior attendings who I respect very much said rectovaginal, like, rectovaginal exam only diagnoses rectovaginal endometriosis. It's not there only. I mean, 
50% is somewhere else in, in the high rectum, rest of the bowel. It should all be examined. Then the question becomes, do you have painless intimacy? Not, not with the intruder's initial stage when the penetration, it's deep contact pain. Yes. yes. We're not talking about vaginismus has nothing to do with endometriosis. Vaginismus have to do with bad sexual uh, experience or definitely or some psychologically uh, trauma that that uh, that contraction of vaginismus event happens. That's mm -hmm. nothing to do with endo. Endo is deep contact pain. Right, right. And they jump. The sex is not fun anymore. But mm -hmm. they can't say that initially. No woman says my sex is immediately. I guess that's what I gathered. It's not that I'm not a woman, but but I hear. Uh, but uh, in general, in certain cultures, women never say they're because they become unattractive, they become whatever it is, you know. Let's not get there. It's not like women in pain during sex. It does not necessarily mean that the guy may think he may be doing very well, you know, whatever it is. That's not, these things, I'm not trying to be too sarcastic here, but these are um, true things. Males yeah. have to be educated, mm -hmm. recognizing the agony of pain versus yeah. pleasure. Um and, and we do ask, there's a pain with orgasm, there's a pain with uh, during masturbation. Well, they bring that themselves. I, I don't really ask. I try to be as manly as I can, but overall as medicine, you do ask those questions. With arousal pain, deep contact pain, or after sex, the next day pain. That says the, and you have to combine that with bowel symptoms. Do you have painful bowel movement that deep, uh, contact pain during intimacy is very important to note on the chart because there's rectovaginal disease on this chart. Often that are missed. Other symptoms are, do you have shortness of breath? Do you have chest pain during period? Mm -hmm. These are important things. Okay. All right. Thank Did you I for that. Anything? That there's was... Also some urological... You have to... I mean, the magic question of the physician should ask, okay, you have these symptoms. Do they flare up with symptoms? Mm -hmm. They flare up with, with, with menstruation. Are these symptoms flaring up? If they're flaring up, the puzzle is solved. A lot of things about the puzzle is solved. And 95% of the time, you, you go with these cardinal symptoms positive. When you question like that, mm -hmm. you see endo inside. Well, thank you for that, uh, Dr. Sechkin. Uh, thank you for all of this great information. Um, we it's almost uh time for uh we're almost at the close so um before we sign off today is there any last piece of advice that you'd like to share with the my endometriosis team and endo found communities look there, there's this is definite okay so let nobody fool you if you have menstrual pain beyond two days and it's not alleviated with regular tylenol and things like that Mm -hmm. Please be aware that uh, other symptoms that with the endometriosis should be in your mind if they are getting worse and flaring up bowel symptoms, your uh, so-called um, um, IBS symptoms or uh, ICC, interstitial cystitis mm -hmm. symptoms are getting bad. Please consider endometriosis and do not believe uh, doctors that are diverting you to things that are not going to help you. The most important thing is going to a gynecologist who knows what they're doing. First, medical management. Medical mm -hmm. management takes care of organizing, you know, suppressing the periods and ovulation. If that doesn't help, think about your age. If you're, I mean, you can be married, trying to get pregnant at the age of 35, or you could be 23, uh, suffering with this losing time from work or your activities. Endometriosis can cause serious future uh, issues with, uh, you know, multiple surgeries, being undiagnosed, anxiety, depression, you name it. Early, early sus suspicion, let's put it, suspicion mm -hmm. through awareness. Early detection with the right doctor without any surgery. Early diagnosis, timely diagnosis with proper intervention, but timely not jumping on with, with a surgeon who knows what they're doing with preferable doing excision surgery is the best prevention of 
deep endometriosis that we we were supposed to be talking all today. So early intervention with peritoneal endometriosis around before the age of 25, I think is the key mm-hmm. to prevent a lot of SOCAL complication that comes with endometriosis that even involves infertility. Many of these women can know, and they can jump to another stage. They are validated psychologically. They know they have endo. They prepare their life accordingly. Validation becomes so important. After you exercise 20, 30 lesions, woman says, I was right. They were wrong. I changed my life. I have the power of doing that, which you can, really. I mean, that's the, that's it. Obviously, issues of egg freezing and egg banking are important important developments nowadays. Uh, magical things are happening. So endometriosis is a treatable disease. In some cases, it's curable too. All right. So the people who are who are who have who are living completely pain free, having children, don't even want to talk about it. They move on. You don't hear from them. Unfortunately, it's the uh, it's the patients who are not who are incompletely had surgery. That's what I believe. Many people who have complete surgery have excellent course in life. I mean, I really propose people don't say, yeah, you live with endo. Yes, it is. It's never perfect because in advanced stages, healing of the surgery also leaves scars. Mm -hmm. Uh, Scars, not necessarily endo, but when you look back, you see very little endo, but still there are scars. There are hidden endo somewhere. That becomes incurable. But if it's done early, in some cases, it works well. But having said that, having said that still, there are patients genetically on a different uh, fast train, the way endometriosis goes with them. It's very difficult. They develop adenomyosis very early, 23, 22 years old. Those are different groups. Luckily, not too, not very common, but still in those cases, you have to be on top of things. Uh, okay. and Thank you. Guide Thank them, you right? so much. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that advice. Um, um, I'm sorry, we're, we're coming to the close um, of our, our talk. Uh, Dr. Sachkin, uh, thank you so much for providing such uh, wonderful advice. Um, and thank you for sharing your expertise with us today. And to our viewers out there, um, if you are listening in and you're interested in continuing the conversation with others in the endo community, join our team on My Endometriosis Team, the official online community of the Endometriosis Foundation. Thanks for listening in today. And don't forget to tune in into our uh, next event on My Endo uh, Team on Wednesday, March 30th, for a conversation with Congresswoman Abby Finkenauer, about self-advocacy and endometriosis. We hope to see you there. Thanks again, Dr. Suchkin. Thank you. Thank you for having me.